Her newest novel, Little Threats, was published by G.P. Putnam's Sons and was named an Apple Books Best of November 2020 pick. She lives in Brooklyn, where she is a producer with the indie media company Her Heroic Collective. And Rebecca Fishow is a prose writer, creative writing instructor, and visual artist. Her story collection, The Trouble with Language, Transfer Books 2020, won the 2019 Holland Prize for Fiction. She holds an MFA from Syracuse University and lives in Western Maryland. Enjoy the show, everyone. I'm gonna clap because I wanna clap for you, Rebecca. Thank you. Yeah, like if we were in the store, they'd be clapping and I feel like there should definitely be clapping whenever an author <laughs> launches their book. Well, we can do that. We can make that happen. Maybe some snaps too. <laughs> yeah, I know that's, I was doing it pretty lightly because I didn't want to overwhelm. <laughs> Uh, are you going to read for us like right off the top? Because I, I have so many stories in here that I just love and I really, I'm eager to hear them out loud. Yeah, I would love to start off with a reading. Um, my collection has about 30 stories and they, they vary in length from being very short to um, kind of more traditional sh short story. And I'm going to start off with one that's kind of in the, in the middle of the length of that are represented here. Um, but first, thank you to Green Apple Books for hosting us. And Emily, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, and Erica, thank you for that introduction. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you, Erica and Rebecca for asking me and Green Apple. Okay, so I'm gonna read a story called A Failed Kidnapping. I would like to kidnap my childhood friend, Demetra. This will not be easy to do. I have not seen or heard from Demetra in 12 long years. And though I think I have seen her on the psychic network, I do not know where she is. She could be on top of a mountain or swimming in a pool or shaving her armpits over a sink. I am lying in bed, wondering where to start. My husband is awake now, getting ready for the day, but I am afraid to get out of bed. I do not like days very much anymore. Days are like snakes. They tempt me to do complicated things. I hear water boiling for the French press and my husband dropping a bagel into the toaster. I pull the covers over my head. Demetra is a psychic, this much I know. I close my eyes tightly and try to speak to her with my mind. Demetra, please let me know where you are. I remember your golden hair, your big sad eyes. I want to kidnap you if it comes to that. I think about all the dead people I have ever known. My mother's father and my father's mother are sitting now on the couch of my childhood house, blinking and looking at each other. Who the hell are you, my grandmother asks. I don't know, she sa uh, says my grandfather, could be I'm dead. My grandmother is holding a paper bag of plastic toys that she has collected from cereal boxes and home shopping channels. She is frowning, but I love gifts. When I go to retrieve a toy from the bag, she slaps my hand. That's not for you, she says. You are always such a greedy child. My grandfather is holding a pencil and a pad of paper. He asks me to come sit next to him and draw. I sit next to him and he gives me a piece of paper, snaps the pencil in half and sharpens it for me. A tree sprouts in front of us and we draw the tree in silence. After half an hour, I look at his paper, but it is blank. I need your help, I say to the dead grandparents. Humph, my grandmother says, nobody ever helped me. My grandfather only looks at me dumbly. It's okay, I say to the dead grandparents, you can go. They both disappear. My husband lies on me on the bed, shiny eyes and mouth with smile. Morning, he says, and shakes me. Words are streaming out of his mouth. I try very hard to listen and understand. He is in bed now and I am standing up. I am pacing around the apartment, feeling for ghosts. Our cat follows me around. I pet the cat and think if I do not do anything else in my life but take care of this little gray cat, if I do not go outside and just stay here and be nice to a cat, I would not have caused any trouble for the rest of my days. And maybe I will feel okay when I die. That's no way to think, my husband says. I smile. He hands me a cup of coffee. Outside it's raining and gray. My cat rubs his head on my leg. I wanna find my old best friend, Demetra, I say. I'm going to kidnap her and make her find the ghost in this house. We'll have to go outside for that, my lover says, and I know he is probably right. 
It takes me four hours to go outside. I watch a lot of TV and I eat two slices of maple sugar pie. I feel sugar sick. I try to sleep. My head is on a lazy Susan. A voice inside my head says gross. You are right voice, I think you are right. I roll up my sleeve and scrub dried food off the dishes, ketchup flecks and chicken bits circle the drain. I soak myself down in the shower. I rub the soap on a washcloth and rub the washcloth on my skin. Scrubbing feels good. I'm ready to go out. What will I ask Demetra after I have kidnapped her? Does she remember the first time we played in second grade? I helped her find the alphabet letters that Ted wrote for her in the clouds. Ted was Demetra's first best friend. His appendix burst and he died. When I found a letter, I checked with Demetra to make sure I had seen things right. Is that an A, I would ask, and she would say, write it down. Then Demetra unscrambled the letters into words like chili and rascal and long. She grinned for a while, but I worried I hadn't really spotted any letters at all. I had only been making them up because I wanted to play. The world is so big. It stretches forever in all directions, goes on and on. I walk up a hill and look at the faces of walking people. Some of them smile and some of them frown. I worry I am frowning and try to smile. I make eye contact, then look away when eye contact is returned. I make eye contact with a little girl through the glass of a coffee shop window. I enter, order an espresso, and think about Demetra. Did she believe we were witches back in fourth grade when we stood in a circle in the park, held knives to each other's throats, recited initiation incantations, and became an official coven? The little girl draws a picture next to me. She shows me her picture of a monster riding a unicorn. That's a good picture, I say, and she says it's lousy. The monster is too lumpy and the unicorn's a unicow. Besides, it's all I can ever think to draw. Would you tell me a story or what? Once upon a time, there was a girl who had a best friend named Demetra. Demetra was a psychic, but nobody believed her. Not even the girl, not really. To cope with her loneliness, Demetra cut her skin and pulled out her hair. Demetra smiled as she pulled out her hair in front of the girl and said, see, it doesn't hurt. Her best friend did not know what to believe, the smile or the understanding of pain. One day, Demetra took a whole bottle of aspirin, but she did not die. The little girl says, that's a very sad story. And I say it is, but it has a happy ending. One day, Demetra decided, I am a psychic and that's the way it is. She moved to a farmhouse and opened a psychic studio. To this day, she has exercised 83 trapped souls and helped 48 pet owners speak to their pets. She lived happily ever after, and that's the end. The little girl crumples up her drawing and tells me she has a secret. She has a very big secret, and she is going to tell me now. The little girl says she is not a little girl, but a moose. She is finally ready to commit to being a moose. We walk to a nearby park and stand in the middle of a lot of grass. The little girl asks me to hold her hand because she is nervous about transforming into a moose. Small tears form in her eyes and I wipe them away with a tissue. Okay, I say, okay. I watch the little girl become a moose. It takes some time. At first, she looks like she's constipated. Her insides vibrate underneath her skin. She lets out a couple little yelps. Her body bulges and her eyes bug out. Antlers break through her forehead and she grows very large. Finally, she is a completely grand, majestic moose. She grunts at me and says she will miss some things about her human form, eating chocolate, for example, and jumping rope. She bares her teeth and thumps away towards a section of the park that is layered with trees. Back home, I wait for my husband to return from work. I fry a cheese sandwich and microwave tomato soup. I sit on the couch and look around the house. It feels very small and very large, like a cage with no walls. A book falls off the bookshelf, so I pick it up and read. The book is about a man who had killed another man but can't remember that he did. When my husband comes home, we kiss. I look out the window and we hug. Did you find Demetra, he asks. I say I did not get the chance to start looking. We watch TV in bed to fall asleep. We complain a lot about TV, but lately we've been watching a lot. 
we watch a TV show about a man who has killed a man and remembers it and is in trouble with the law. After the show, my husband says, I hate TV. A show starts good and then it just gets worse and worse like the creators don't have a clue. But this suspense makes me wanna keep watching. I pull the covers up to my ears and blink and think like life. Sometimes I talk to my husband without speaking. I say, I love you so much. I love you more than the sun. I want to crawl into your body and fill you up. I wait for him to smile or blush, to say something back using his mouth or not. You can try to blame him for your lack of communication. You can believe he reciprocates anyways, even if you aren't sure. You can tell yourself loving is better than being loved. And even though he doesn't hear it, doesn't mean it isn't true. The cat attacks my leg. His ears shoot back and his eyes are nuts. When I say stop cat, he walks a circle around himself, settles down and licks his leg. Maybe tomorrow, I think, as I lay on my back in bed. But before I can think about what might happen tomorrow, what I might do, or whether or not I will believe, I'm not here anymore. I don't know where I am. I am someplace else entirely. Thank you. I love that. Um, so here, here's the thing about the story collection. And I mean, I think you chose such a, a really brilliant piece to start with because it shows us so much that's in the collection in terms of being both realistic and in, in its details, you know, you've chosen them so carefully and the dialogue all sounds, you know, like conversations that we have. And then at the same time, this surreal element that creeps in around the edges. And I just, I love the back and forth that you have between the stories and sometimes like with this one within a story. Um, I can't believe you have, you have 30 stories in this, you know, in this book and, um, it never feels like we're it never feels like we're reading something that wasn't meticulously crafted and i mean at the same time when i'm reading it i'm not really thinking about that i'm just following you and in that reading especially you know i just feel like you're you're inviting us to follow the character through these thoughts and through this time and all of these uh, really fascinating um really fascinating occurrences it's like the only way that i can put it that's nice to hear that it feels that way. Um, I feel like sometimes that's that's my experience of the world. You know, it's very mundane, and yet there's a strangeness that we all experience, kind of in our own, you know, in our own minds <laughs> that that filters into our our perception. <laughs> Well, there's a little bit in that story in particular about going back and forth in time and all the things that she remembers from her childhood and then with her regular day, um, which I think, you know, helps make those leaps. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask is, you know, obviously with any short story collection, um, I think most authors work on them for a very long time. Um, you know, because you're putting so many different pieces together in order to, you know, come up with something that has a spine and that all kind of hangs together. And so what I wanted to ask you was, you know, about choosing the stories, but also like which story in the book would be your earliest and which one the most recent? Yeah. Um, so yeah, this, this collection did take quite a while. Um, I've been working on these stories. Um, for about 10 years. I think the earliest stories in this book, um, a couple of them were, you know, early drafts of them were written when I was in grad school and um, I graduated from Syracuse in 2012 and it's 2021 already. Um, so they, um, and they've been, they were all written within those last 10 years. And as I've been sort of moved a lot and um, just kept going. Um, some of the earliest stories are the ones that are actually a little bit more sort of realistic um, and grounded in what resembles, I think, more of, of what um, life might look like for, you know, most people, <laughs> I don't know, um, and the, lo the longer ones too. So um, an exercise in etiquette is one of the very early ones. Um, I think that's probably the first one in the book. And that was actually the story that Joyland published um, yeah. early that on. Was, and that was my first introduction to you um, and through your work, which came, I think, just through the inbox. Um, it is going back a ways, but that was such a, um, that story made such an impact on me. 
um, you know, that I could still remember all the all the details, even when I encountered it here, even though stories go through, you know, lots of changes over time. Um, and what's what was the most recent? The most recent story is actually the very final story in the collection, Three Women I Almost Loved. And all right, yeah, Three Women I Almost Loved. And that story was um, when I submitted the manuscript, that story wasn't even part of it. But um, with talking with my editor and we we're just kind of thinking about the right story to end the book with. And I was like, well, I have this, you know, this very new story that that could work. And we thought we decided that it, it really fit as a, a nice uh, place to end the book, um, kind of tying some different threads and different themes together and um, leaving it a nice place. Um, I don't I don't know if you if you have an answer for this, but what do you think that you learned in between those two stories as a as a writer or just in terms of looking at your craft? Um, I think I think that I've definitely um, learned a lot. I think the more you write, the, the more you learn about writing in some ways. I think one of the bigger things I might have learned is to just kind of trust, trust my gut and to let myself um, be playful with, with my writing when it, when it feels right. Um, I also think I learned a little bit about how I work as a writer in terms of um, just the, you know, getting the work done. Um, so some of this, the shorter stories in the book are shorter probably because of, you know, time constraints and, um, and I, you know, I like getting to um, the ending. <laughs> I like, I like, I like endings. So I think part of it is just um, learning how to kind of shift my writing um, life to fit whatever's going on in my life. And also just to let myself, you know, be playful in my writing and trust, trust that, um, there's, there's, there might be something to that. Yeah. So in some ways, the form has, the form has moved to fit you, rather than feeling like you have to change. Yeah, I think that's true. <laughs> um, um, I think that the book is incredibly playful. I mean, this is one of the things that I really love about it is in a lot of ways, you know, there are some stories here that are almost like poetry in the way that uh, you really focus on an image or, you um, a turn of phrase, you know, you have, um, you're taking a lot of risks, I think that we don't normally see, like, I think I was telling you, it reminded me of like Donald Bartelm or Miranda July, um, and, and their work, um, the fact that you're just willing to try something out, like one of the stories that I really loved, which I think I told you this already is the one about, um, she imagines her mind divided, and it becomes two dogs and each dog goes off and has a different life. There's the dog that's domesticated and you know it has to behave, but it gets its dinner and the other dog that like wanders freely. And it's just sort of that kind of um, being open to, to just being conceptual like that, I found really engaging and exciting. I'm glad. I almost, I thought about reading that story tonight, but then I, I was practicing it and I realized it has the, the F word at least three times. And I thought maybe that, that wouldn't be the best choice for, for this evening. But yeah, I think that um, sometimes I'm driven a little bit by something that feels honest to um, an emotional state or a perception, not necessarily um, something that can happen on earth, but more of a feeling or a sensibility. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this is was there a story here that you spent more time revising or that you decided to go back and try new things with once you knew that you were going to move towards a collection? Um, there's definitely stories in here that have been revised quite a bit. Um, I'm not sure if I would would necessarily say that I revised stories to try new things with them, but um, just to figure out what worked for them. Um, one of the more realistic stories, something to do, some um, someone to love. That was another one of the early ones. And I think the first draft came in when I was in grad school. That story, um, I changed around a lot as I was revising. It was twice as long at one point. Um, and then I, you know, started sending it out and wasn't really getting much um, response to it. And I was like, okay, there's something wrong with this story. So I, I cut out about half of it. I made it really tight. And I think I changed the point of view as well. And all of a sudden, it worked. So 
Um, some some stories I find just like really do take a while to to get um, get them to be the shape that they need to be, not just for me, but for the reader and for um, I don't know um, the the just where what the story needs. Um, we we were talking actually about um, painting and its influence on like the techniques that you use when you're writing fiction. Um, Rebecca confided in me that she paints as a hobby and although her paints are paintings are online and they're very good I'm completely totally jealous that you are multi-talented um can you tell us actually about that we were um just in terms of like how you look at painting versus how you look at a story or presenting yeah. visuals yeah um I think that the the two arts have a, a lot of a lot in common um, in terms of my relationship to them. I, I feel that I feel less pressure when I'm painting. So painting is kind of like in hobby world and writing is kind of in, um, I don't know, something that I take a slightly more seriously. So there's, there's a difference there, but I think that painting, um, you know, I often think about the, the process of creating a painting and as sort of like a good metaphor for, for the way that a story or um, maybe even a novel, if, if that comes one day, um, might work in that. So when you're creating a painting, um, generally you create an underpainting first and you kind of get everything kind of brushed in, um, not with details, just so you know placement and you kind of can see the whole picture and then you kind of build up um, detail by detail over that until it's where you want it to be. And I think with, um, with writing, it can work well that way too, um, which is something that I need to remind myself because, um, you know, to think of the sort of big picture before kind of going into those little details. If you work too closely on one small spot, you might kind of mess with the whole proportions of the whole piece. And um, as a writer, I think sometimes I get frustrated, right? That I can't see the whole picture or, or that maybe I'm focusing too much on a small detail. And then I kind of have to remind myself like, oh, it's okay if it's messy at first, um, it'll get there. You just need to start seeing it clearly. I think a lot of writers do that. I think that we tend to focus, for instance, like just on the beginning of a story and we can spend like three or four pages when we only need a couple of paragraphs. Like I know that I do that. I spend way too long on my beginnings, whether it's a short story or a novel. And then I'm just like, it's all, like you say, it's out of proportion. I think I need to do this. How do I do like a sketch? You know what I yeah, mean? I, How do I, I figure? Wondering. Do you, um, do you, when you're working on a novel, do you do any sort of outlining or anything like that? Or is it kind of like jumping into the project? I, I use little cards, you know, like this one with notes and I like put them up above my desk, but I have a tendency to just jump in with both feet. It's true. Uh, well, then the note sounds like a great idea. I mean, that's the visual thing. Um, so with a painting, you you get to see the progress really clearly. It's right in front of you. And with a book, it's not not quite the same way. So I think visual cues can be, can be really helpful. Yeah. Oh, you've talked a couple of times about doing your MFA at Syracuse. Mm -hmm. Um, but you've, you've spent time in a lot of cities. I mean, you were in, was it Boston and Montreal? And then you also did, I think there was a residency that you did overseas somewhere? Yeah, so I um, grew up in New Hampshire and um, I did my undergrad and um, my MFA at Syracuse in Syracuse, New York. So I was there for about seven years. Um, then I moved to Montreal with my now husband. He was getting a PhD at McGill and um, I followed him there, which was not too hard for me because I'm a dual citizen, luckily. So, so I moved to Montreal. Um, now I'm in Western Maryland, uh, Frederick, Maryland. Um, yeah, I did. But wait, wait, it spun though, right? Because he followed you there, sort We've of. We've been following each other for years. We actually we <laughs> met in high school and we just follow each other around. <laughs> yeah. It's a good description of a relationship, any relationship. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. Um, so, tell, but tell me more about doing the MFA at Syracuse. You were you were working with people like George Saunders and Rivka Galchin, who had really wonderful things to say about this. I'm going to put my glasses on. Um, if you're in the store, if you're in Green Apple, you have to pick up a copy and look at all the wonderful things people have said because um, I think they're true. Rivka Galchin said, "I could read any one of these stories any number of times, and their joy, darkness, and intelligence would remain fresh, mysterious, and bracing." Fischau is an extraordinary talent. And George Saunders called your work haunting, compelling, and beautifully written. 
I have very generous blurbers. I know. I'm like bowled <laughs> over and it's not even my book. I mean, what was it like doing the MFA um, and working with, with both of those individuals? Uh, the, it was, Syrac being in Syracuse was really um, an amazing experience. It was um, the kind of program that really encourages you to just kind of like work with what what your voice and what your style is and try new things and um, never really felt like anyone was trying to push me to, to be one thing or another um, in my writing. And I was pretty young when I did my MFA. And so I really was in a place where I was, I was very much like exploring my voice and my, um, my interests as a writer. Um, there, when I was, I did my undergrad there too. And there's some amazing poetry faculty as well. And um, I took a lot of poetry classes as an undergrad. So I think um, some of my style is sort of inspired um, by the sort of poetry side of the Syracuse writing faculty, um, Michael Burkhardt and Chris Kennedy. Chris Kennedy is a sort of an amazing prose poet. And um, I think when you see sort of the prose poety stuff in my work a little bit, it comes from working with people like that. Um, George Saunders is just a fabulous, guy his um you know everything we sort of hear about him or um you know his i guess you could say public persona um <laughs> is very very true to to who he is he's just a super generous um person who's also can talk about any story and in such an intelligent way and just like break it apart and see see what makes it tick see what makes it special um, and he has that engineering background. So sometimes in workshops, um, we really get into it with sort of like mapping out and graphing out plots and things like that, which was helpful to me because plot is not my, I don't consider plot to be my, um, one of my natural <laughs> talents. Wait, so, wait, no, wait, wait, I have to interrupt you because you have some plots. They're just <laughs> unusual plots. <laughs> um, like I, the thing that I really want to talk about is I want to talk about the severed head. And I would say that this, this Timothy's severed head, I mean, if you look at the book cover, I'm guessing that this is, you know, this is the reference here of the head. And um, you're going to have to explain what happens in the story. But I mean, I think it has a plot, even though it's, uh, it's, it's a bizarre kind of little parable almost. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to let you tell it. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, so Timothy's severed head, I suppose that's a severed head. Um, that story is one of the longer stories in the book. And it is, um, it's 11 little sections long. So it's kind of, um, it's got some kind of inter interesting structural stuff I was playing with. But when it comes to the plot of the story, essentially, um, it's about these four roommates, and one of them receives a severed head in a box and the severed head more or less functions as almost a sort of good luck charm which sounds crazy I know because it's a severed head but um, in the story it really affects the characters in different ways and as the story progresses their relationships change based on um, how each of them are changing and um, it's also a bit, I, I would say a bit of a med meditation on suffering and how we sort of relate to each other's suffering. So yeah, that, that story, the plot is really following the relationships of these roommates. Um, some of them are dating and things fall apart or come back together. And they, and they also kind of have these like petty jealousies of each other too, which I really like, you know, and they're a little bit jealous, you know, the ones that didn't receive the head wish that they had. Yeah, it's true because so they see the the um, the character Timothy who did receive the head, um, his life changes a little bit for the better, and that's just something that they. <laughs> but this is this is this is like <laughs> this is the kind of risk I think you know that is really so fun in this collection. Was this so? This was was this one of the stories that you worked on during that MFA, or did you? No, um, this story okay. is, an, is a newer story. Um, I wrote that while living here in, in Maryland. And I think that the first draft was written in a scramble in during a winter 
very quick winter break. I'm a, I teach creative writing in a high school and I was, I remember feeling a little bit frustrated that I, that I wasn't writing as much as I wanted to. And I just sat down in that, that break and pumped out the whole first draft. And um, so, yeah, that's a little bit later. I, when I first started writing that story, I, I think the very first line is what I, ha I had to go off of. Whoever suffers most receives the severed head. And I pictured it as being kind of um, like unrelated vignettes. I thought it was going to be just a series of kind of flash fi fiction vignettes that use this symbol as, of the severed head in different ways. But then it turned out that I actually had some characters that I wanted to work with and see what would happen with them. Um, so, so it really is a cohesive narrative from start to finish. Yeah, the first time I was reading that, I was reading it in the laundromat, and I was like, I hope no one's like looking over my shoulder. They'll just see the word "severed head" again and again. <laughs> but I mean, I love that your work is is you know sometimes shocking, and you mentioned the F word, and there's actually there's a lot of sex in the collection, and it's it's often you know it's it's very playful. Like I think it's it is a very playful book. Thank you. Um, you were mentioning when we talked before um, other influences too, like people like Kelly Link and Amy Bender, and I think those are really good comparisons for your work too. I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit kind of about the surrealist influence, because I feel like a lot of these stories, you know, adhere to that, that yeah. style. Um, I, I think kind of early on um, in my probably early 20s, I started to get more interested in writers who were taking um, chances and getting a little bit more surreal or fabulous, um, magical realists. Like I'm, those terms all sort of mean slightly different things, but they all they all exist in the in the realm of you know unexpected, sometimes magical or um, un unreality types of things happening. So. I think when I was younger, I was really kind of impressed and amazed by writers like Amy Bender and Murakami. Um, Edgar Caret uh, is a wonderful Israeli writer who just has these stories that are all sorts of creative. Um, and as I've gotten older, I've continued to read more work like that and um, more diverse work, more you know historical work like that. I started reading like Leonora Carrington, who's one of the kind of mothers, grandmothers of surrealism, and um, um, people like Clarice Lispector too, who's not. I, I don't. I don't know if I would call her so surrealist, but she's definitely very strange. So just, I've I've been kind of drawn to writers who, whose narratives don't feel quite, um, quite like the traditional realist thing that that we see a lot of. Yeah, here, here for strange. I love it. <laughs> Um, I mean, that's one of the things that I love so much about your work is just that you can head into a story and you think it's going to be one thing and then it turns out to be another. Mm -hmm. um, like you have this one story, Visiting Sarah 2005, it's called. And there's a line in it that I really like, which just I feel like you're very good at evoking a scene and the reality of something. And it's we turn a corner and enter a club that's so loud I could forget my speech has sound. Mm -hmm. And then in that same story, which is, it's one of the longer stories also, and it's very realistic, and it's about sisters, um, one of whom is in the, uh, the Marines. And then at the same time, you have something absolutely strange happening, you know, where they wind up in a cab, and there's another couple in the cab, and they're giving birth to a baby. And I'm giving, I'm spoiler alert. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm totally like giving away spoilers tonight. I'm sorry. But I, I just wondered, how do you, how do you make these jumps when you start you know, is it a different toolkit? Most of them, I, I think most of them, I don't feel like I'm not, I'm not sitting there going, okay, what, what thing can happen here that is strange and will change the story. A lot of them, they just kind of happen as I'm writing um, and I let them. Um, and then, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out and the stories that don't work out end up in a file on my desktop called the graveyard and but sometimes they do work out and in that story um I remember really thinking about yeah so there's this moment there's this one kind of surreal moment in, in an otherwise very realistic story and um I thought about 
editing that section out, I think, for a little while because it just it's it's kind of an anomaly. And I think that there was some conversation with an editor at one point um, early on about whether or not that part should stay. And I just felt ultimately really kind of um, sure that it needed to be there. Sometimes it's those strange moments that make a story work. Um, I couldn't see the story being as um, powerful if that moment wasn't in the story. So I needed to leave it there. And this, uh, you know, I remember actually being in one of George Saunders classes. I think it was, it was his class on the Russians. And he has a book coming out about this class sort of that, that's going to be amazing, I'm sure of it. But I remember one moment we were talking about, it might've been a Turgenev story. And we we're talking about some strange moment in the story. And he just said something like, well, sometimes it's like those weird gems, those weird gems that actually make the story work or that make the story like something that people think about, like it catches your attention. Um, and so I've learned to sort of let those moments stand and not try to kind of edit them out for a smoother or more recognizable product. Um, yeah, um, I want to acknowledge that I see that there's a question in the Q&A. And I think what we should do, because we have a little bit of time left, is I want to ask you about publishing, like the whole publishing process and working with uh, Albin and, you know, the, the cover design, which is so stunning. And then maybe you could do another reading for us and then we'll do the questions. But I just want to invite anyone who's who's typing at home to feel free to ask, add some questions to that box and we'll get to them in about five minutes. Um, so actually, can you tell can you tell me about working? with Albin and Transfer Books? Definitely. Um, so this book came to be, um, Transfer had their Holland Prize for Fiction. Um, and I submitted my manuscript to that. Um, and Albin chose my manuscript to be published, which was amazing and wonderful and just made me uh, obviously very happy. Um, did you shout like when you got the news? Like, did you cheer or how did it come? Was it phone or email? I got an email and I'm, I probably just stared at it and like grinned um, <laughs> idiotically for like five minutes and then ran downstairs to tell my husband that <laughs> that I got an email. So um, yeah, and from there, the, um, the process with working with Transfer and Albin has been like incredibly amazing. Um, Albin is a, um, not only a fabulous editor, but a fabulous designer and I feel like um, you know, it was really smooth working with him and kind of we, we, um, the editing process was, was great. We kind of talked about a few things and made a few changes and just kind of put the book together. And then Alvin worked his magic and made this beautiful design and, um, just feels like a very, um, I don't know, just a very beautiful artifact. <laughs> um, and it was just a pleasure to kind of see it come together and to see these designs that he was creating and the care that he put into it. Yeah, it's hardcover. I'm just going to say that for anyone who hasn't, you know, been able to get out to Green Apple Books, which is physically open, so you should go there and get it there. Um, but it is, it's beautiful. It's hardcover. I love it. Um, do you want to read for us? Are you... Yes, have some water, refresh. Yeah, um, sure. I, I'm really, I'm putting you through the paces tonight. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm making you, I'm it's making you tell me, tell me everything. <laughs> yeah, why don't I read? I'm going to read just one of the shorter ones. It's a, it's a shorter, a little bit darker story um, called The Tall Thin Man. If you have the book, it's on page 95. If you want to read along. A tall, thin man came to the city. He crossed the bridge in the middle of the darkest night of the year. The moon had eaten itself three days ago, and the crumbs left over looked like weak stars. Sadness had set in to the cracked brains of the people here, the way a building softens at the corners. I had packed my bags and was carrying my suitcase to the bus station, but the sight of a man halted me. I turned around, went home, wondered about the nature of hope. In the morning, the tall man went door to door, passing out gifts. He said, these gifts are your new moons. He gave an old woman a set of salt and pepper shakers shaped like clones. 
He gave a little boy a Native American headdress. He gave a pair of newlyweds a long rope ladder. He gave me a tall coat rack with brass hooks. To each person, he spoke the very same words. You are living in my dream. By noon, a crowd had assembled around the fountain in front of City Hall. The tall, thin man stood in the center of the crowd as though he were a planet and the people were his moons. The people all held their gifts like weapons and the old woman threw her salt and pepper shaker at his head. The little boy held his headdress around the man's neck. The newlyweds whipped him with their rope ladder. I waited, clutching my coat rack for somebody to stop me. By the end of the day, the man had gone black and we all cried, our grief was so deep. Along the bottom of the fountain, tiny wildflowers grew. Some were purple, some were so yellow we mistook them for gold. I knew that I would miss them. I went home and found my suitcase still packed, still full of gifts I would one, get, one day give to other people in some other city far away that I would never understand. Thank you. I love it. Um, okay, I'm going to move us to the Q&A because I see you, you have quite a few questions piling up. I love it. Um, so how was the experience, or sorry, how has the experience been to release your stories in such a way, both in the sense of giving these to the world, but also in the finality of allowing the pieces to be finished, to stop revision and put them into print? I um, was very, I felt actually very relieved to have them be put into print and to be called finished. Um, I, I, I was ready for that finality with these stories. Um, I'm excited to move on to whatever comes next. Um, and I think that these stories are, you know, I, they're the best that I could have made them. And I'm proud of the way they turned out. And I'm glad that they are out there now and um you know it's a very it's a very interesting time to be to be um sending a book out in the world <laughs> um of course yeah, because of COVID. Definitely. <laughs> i'm sure you experience the same thing so um i'm glad that it's that it's getting to people and i hope that it feels like a um a worthy pandemic read I think it's a worthy pandemic read because it distracted me totally. Once I was reading them, I was completely immersed. I mean, because you really do take us on like these small journeys, you know, I just, I could forget all about my newsfeed. Well, good. I'm glad. I felt that way when I was reading Little Threats too, actually. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so Anna Mary asks, uh, how did you choose the title of the collection? Okay, good question. Um, so one of the, it's one of the stories is called that and for for a little while I was going between the trouble with language and a different uh, title from one of the stories something to do someone to love and I decided to stick with trouble with language we thought that it really kind of um, spoke to a lot of the complications that a lot of these characters kind of have um, either um, holding back what they really want to say and um, kind of presenting something different through words than what they're really feeling or thinking or having trouble communicating their um, perceptions of the world to others. Um, and, and we just felt that the, the title, The Trouble with Language, really got to something about um, the challenges of of being able to express yourself and to be really known by others um, through through the um, the tools we have to do that, language being one of the big ones. I think, okay, so I'm gonna jump in here and say one of the things I really liked about that title when I got to the story is it seemed to me like it's a story about people trying to decide. And, you know, it's about someone trying to choose their words. And I felt like there was a lot of this in, in the collection in terms of it being a theme is like people are kind of, a lot of your characters are at a spot where they're looking in two directions and trying to make up their minds about which way to go. Yeah, I think you're right about that, definitely. <laughs> okay, uh, Brady says, many of your stories have an allegorical tone. To what extent do you have a concept in mind before you start writing? Or do you find those values along the way? And by the way, we were reading along, you rock, Becca. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brady. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Um, I don't think that most of the stories, I don't come into 
most or maybe any of my stories thinking I know what the, the meaning or the takeaway or the theme or the message will be. I feel like if I did, the story might fall a little flat on the page. Um, um, part of the, I think that when, when a writer is surprised while they're writing, the reader is more likely to be surprised too. Um, and that's not to say that I don't, that, that I don't have messages or thoughts or things that I'm, that I'm trying to convey. That's probably just going to come through in whatever I write, because it's something that I'm thinking about. Um, if that makes sense. I think that um, I mean, some stories, so some stories, some of the longer ones, especially like while I'm writing them, say it's a first draft and I'm writing and I'm sort of like figuring it out as I go along, I'll make like bullet point, um, just like little bullet, bullet, bullet point things of that it may be like plot points are also like, this is where the theme is going. Like if, if it shows up while I'm writing, but I almost never go into a story knowing what I'm trying to say or trying to convey. Right. Or what the full arc is. Yeah. I almost never know that either. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I think I agree with you. I think there has to be that little frisson, you know, like for the writer as well as the reader. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that if you set out with a, with a perfect image in your head of what you're going to create, you're going to be disappointed. And that's something that I have to tell my students a lot too, because, um, like just to get them used to the idea of writing and the process being the thing that teaches you what a story is about rather than wishing that it would look like this like idealized image of whatever the thing was that's in your head. And the, the group that you're teaching is quite young, right? It's um, you're teaching at a high school. Yeah, they are young. They are um, between about 14 and 18 or 19 and they are all creative writing students. So they all go to an art school where all the students make pretty much major in an art. Um, so they're very serious, even though they're very young, they're very, um, they're, they're all in when it comes to writing. Yeah, can I rewind and I, can I go to that, that high school? I know, I wish it was around when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, someone asks, do you have any stories that are favorites or ones that you're most proud of? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'm, pr I'm, I'm proud of the collection. I'm, I'm proud of all of them, I think. Um, I think that Timothy's Severed Head is probably one of my favorites, current favorites. <laughs> um, I, yeah, some of them I'm proud of for different reasons. Like, um, some of them I'm proud of for letting myself write about difficult topics or just, um, like, um, an exercise in etiquette. I'm proud of a lot, um, that I that I didn't shy away from from going into certain things with that one in terms of the the themes or the um, the subject matter. And so, I I know that story very well. Do we want to talk about that one or no? Um, yeah, we can talk about that one. Um, I see, but I feel like I've given some spoilers tonight about what happens in the stories. I mean, one of the reasons that one is so shocking is um, it follows a young woman in her work and. Um, she has this exchange with a man and you you know that it's going to turn you know that it is you can feel it building in the pit of your stomach and that it's going to get bad and then you know it's a little bit um i'm not doing a good job of describing it but i mean at the end you let us really know what has happened um and it's it's kind of like you know um a door slamming shut and we hear it and we kind of jolt um you were saying that that was one of the stories that you really worked on, right? Yeah, yes, that, so that story definitely um, took a lot of thought and took a lot of revision. And um, that door slamming moment at the end, <laughs> which we're not, not speaking directly about, <laughs> was, um, was one of the last things that I added into the story because um, I felt like it really needed that, um, that directness and um, that was a moment where I was definitely like, uh, yes, this is not easy to do. This is not easy to put on, on the page, but I think that it's what the story needs. So I'm going to, I'm going to do it. And that felt good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have a question, which is what are you thinking of doing next? Uh, so I really, I hope, I hope I, 
I want to write, um, or at least try writing something um, longer form. And I've, so I've never written a novel successfully before, but I, I love to, and I'm, I'm currently really kind of fascinated by really slim novels. Um, and so I'm thinking maybe I might try my hand in, in maybe the novella length or, you know, kind of use that as a way to get into longer narrative writing. Um, I, I think it, it helps to start with that in mind and then just know that, you know, it, it can plump up from there if need be. Um, but I definitely think that if you write to that length, then um, it gives you places to go also, you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it just you seems, have, go ahead. I, I feel excited about the prospect of staying with certain characters or certain stories for, for a little bit longer, getting to know the characters a little bit better. Yeah. Um, so somebody says, can you please promise us all, can you please promise us all that you'll keep writing? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yes, I am going to keep writing in some, <laughs> some way or, the, or another. Love that. Do you want to read one more short piece for us and we'll say goodbye? Or should we say goodbye now? I, I, yeah, I could. I'm happy to read one more. I think you should, because honestly, when we hear it, like when I hear it, it's so much better than when I try to summarize, you know what I mean? Trying to, it's like trying to summarize poetry. You just can't do it. I mean, should I read the one with a lot of swears in it? The two dogs one? Or is that, is <laughs> um, that going to offend anyone? <laughs> I, I think, I, I think actually that you should read The Trouble of Language because it's the title story. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> All right. The Trouble with Language. Last night, I went to bed thinking that old, endless, quiet thought, I don't ever want to die. Then, in the deep of night, my husband shuddered a little, put his hand on my arm, bolted onto his elbow, and looked at me. It was dark. I could only see the shape of him. He said with strange conviction, I love you. He said it like he had just remembered how deeply he could love, like he had just discovered what love is really. I kissed him on the forehead, then his shoulder. I thought he must be feeling something important. The final dream I had last night was about my mother. I bumped into her in the, at the grocery store deli counter. She was trying desperately to place her order, stuttering her words. On the other side of the counter, two middle-aged women clad in hairnets and aprons did a mocking, eye-rolling thing. I'll take, I don't know, wait, I don't know, my mother said. She did not know what she wanted to say or she did not know how to say it. One of the women scowled and said, you're giving us a lesson in patience and endurance. Yes, my mother said and looked at the floor. She walked away with nothing. It seemed to me that the trouble was not my mother's lack of language, but the women's lack of compassion. When I woke, it was summer in the north. The sun lit the sky softly like a film of jelly over dark toast orange in the underbelly of the clouds. All was very quiet, except the cat. I fed him and then let him out the back door. He stood on the rusty fire escape, mewed into the sky and woke my husband. My husband walked through the kitchen, slow and heavy lidded. Come on, he said to the cat and carried it back to bed. There weren't any dreams or mewing after that, just a sleeping man and a sleeping cat. The apartment grew still and strange and empty. Love it. Uh, I don't know if Erica from Green Apple is gonna come back on and say goodbye to us, yes. And maybe she can tell people where to get your book. Yes, thank you everybody for joining. Thank you, Rebecca and Emily for a wonderful reading. You can get our book at both Green Apple locations. We are open every single day, so come on by. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Good to see everyone.